Good afternoon, and welcome to today's presentation, Pinellas Native Orchids. I'm James Stevenson, and I'm with the University of Florida Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences here in Pinellas County, Florida, coming to you today from Brooker Creek Preserve, a 9,000 acre preserve in North Pinellas County, set aside for the preservation of native upland and freshwater wetland plants and animals, the largest preserve of its type here in our small county. As the University of Florida Extension Services, we offer a variety of uh, solutions for your life, as we like to put it. Our main office is in Largo, and we have different program areas. Here at Brooker Creek, we bring you natural resource information, but you're probably best gonna hear us about our horticulture advice. And within horticulture, we offer lawn and garden advice. We offer Florida friendly landscaping advice. Uh, we service the commercial horticulture industry, but we also have a division of Sea Grant, which deals with coastal issues, including clean marinas, sea level rise, and other uh, issues uh, that concern our coastline. We have a department of urban sustainability learning how to live uh, in our urban uh, county uh, sustainably. That is everything working together for the good of the whole. Uh, we also have families and consumer sciences, which is a fancy modern way of saying home economics. Our program area, as I mentioned, is natural resources. We are not the horticulture branch. So today's presentation on Pinellas native orchids is not a presentation on how to grow them, or how to show them, or how to divide or conquer them. Today, we're just gonna study our native species as they live in the wild. So I hope that's what you signed up for today. And we'll go ahead and get started on orchids. Now, orchids have this reputation of being really fancy, fancy, schmancy, expensive, exotic, uh, difficult. Uh, here's a lady that's just gone crazy over uh, this bouquet of very expensive flowers, very precious. Um, but orchids, they really run the gamut of lifestyles. And we even have a native orchid that lives in the muck and slime of stagnant ponds. And this is a raft of our native uh, water spider orchid being arguably a little less than glamorous. So we're talking about this group of plants called orchids. And what are they? What makes an orchid an orchid? Well, kind of coming down from the largest to the most uh, descriptive, uh, orchids are a plant that belong to a group of plants that are the plants that produce seeds. So the conifers produce seeds and the flowering plants produce seeds. So we're talking they're not ferns, which of course reproduce by spores. So they're seed plants, they're flowering plants. They obviously produce these uh, often very showy flowers. Within the flowering plants, they belong to uh, the split that includes the monocots, the grasses and the palms, uh, the plants that have flower parts in threes and parallel leaf veins. Within the monocots, they belong to a little group called the Asparagales, and if that sounds familiar, yes, asparagus is a genus within this order, the Asparagales, and they produce flowers on a spike. Uh, a long, elongated, if you've ever grown hostas, you know how they have an elongated spike of flowers. They're a monocot that also belong to the Asparagales. And the orchids are one of the two largest of the flowering plant families. So one of the two most diverse and speciated of the flowering plant families. By speciated, I mean they have that many number of species, 28,000, which 28,000 individual species is pretty big. That's like all of the known fish, all the different species of fish, there's that many orchids alone among the flowering plants. So a hugely diverse group, uh, widespread. Um, what botanically makes an orchid an orchid? Well, they have some characteristics that aren't necessarily unique to orchids, but together 
they kind of define what scientists would use to place an unknown specimen into the orchid family. Uh, at some point of the life cycle, they are dependent on a fungus to survive. Uh, the kind of unlike most other plants, the roots lack appendages called root hairs. And root hairs in most other plants are outgrowths of individual root cells that increase the surface area. Because if you think about it, roots are down in the soil, they're anchoring the plant. Increased surface area is going to help anchor that plant even better. And it's also going to increase the surface area to allow uh, for more water exchange and nutri nutrient exchange. So the root hairs are missing in orchids and they found a unique way around having a lack of root hairs. Their flowers twist during their development. So from the formation of the flower bud to the opening of the actual flower, they twist 90 degrees. Individual petals, uh, you can pluck one at a time. They're not fused into a tube like some other flowering plants. One of the orchid petals within a single flower is differentiated into a special landing pad um, called a lip or a labellum. After flowering and once the fruit develops, yes, orchids are fruiting plants because they're flowering plants, they produce a fruit containing the seeds. Their fruit is a dry fruit. Uh, you might call it a seed pod, uh, but it's technically a dry fruit. And when, it, when it's ripe, it dries, splits into six, six valves and the dust-like uh, tiny minute little seeds uh, drift out of that dried seed pod. The seeds are so small, we'll have some close-ups on some seeds in just a second, and you can see how small they are. Um, they lack any nutrition for the embryo. Most seeds, and if you can picture in your mind an individual uh, black bean, let's say, that's an individual seed, and there's an embryo in there, and the bulk of that seed is the food for the developing embryo to get it started on its way before it can become photosynthetic, photosynthetic and make its own food. Orchids, they throw their babies out into the world with no packed lunch whatsoever. They're just sent out. Uh, the embryo has to immediately make that association with a fungus to provide itself with its first meal. Here's a couple of um, uh, microscopic images of individual orchid seeds. And if you look very closely at this seed here, let me grab my pointer, laser pointer. This seed here, uh, you can see the little partitions. Those delineate individual cells. So in this species, we can even count the number of individual cells that make up the seed coat. With the embryo, there's nothing else inside here. That's air. So there's the cells of the seed coat, there's air inside, and then the little embryo just kind of floating out into space. Uh, what has to happen to facilitate germination of this seed is that uh, a fungus has to associate itself with the seed to provide the initial nutrition for that developing orchid embryo. Lacking root hairs, uh, orchids have found, most orchids have found a way around this. They have thick, fleshy roots, uh, which in most of the epiphytic species are covered in a velvet. If you can just see the kind of silvery covering on this ghost orchid roots, um, that's a velvety substance called velamen uh, that acts like a sponge and actually sponges up and hangs on uh, to any collected water. Their flowers twist, as I mentioned before, during development. So here we have an upside down flower, and this is kind of typical of an orchid. When it's twisted through its 90 degrees, this is what an orchid would look like. With that well-developed landing pad, the lip, or the labellum, as we had mentioned before, uh, this is a twisted orchid flower. Here we have on uh, juxtaposed to it on the other side is an orchid that happens not to twist during development. So if you look in this case, that lip is actually uh, standing up on the top side of the flower. 
So I hope you can see that this is the lip as the landing pad. And in this species, that lip is not a landing pad, but it's kind of like a billboard. We'll actually talk about this species a little bit later, uh, but I just wanted to show you that most orchid flowers have a twist where the lip is on the bottom, but in this species, the lip is actually on the top and serving a completely different, uh, doing a completely different job. So this slide can also illustrate how the petals are not fused into a tube. You can see the individual petals quite clearly on this slide. Um, one petal is differentiated into that labellum, which we've just gone over. Uh, the fruit upon ripening splits into six valves. So here we have the ovary, uh, which is ripening. All the parts of the flower that are no longer needed are beginning to wither away on the top of this ovary. Here's an ovary that has actually ripened and the little seeds have escaped, the little dust-like seeds have escaped through these little cracks in that dry fruit wall, those three valves um, within the fruit itself. We mentioned uh, the dust-like seed uh, made up of just individual cells forming the seed coat, air on the inside and the poor little embryo with nothing to eat uh, inside. Um, very, very specialized way of, of reproduction. And orchids, if you think about it, if the seeds are only a few cells across, how many thousands of cells could fit into an individual capsule, kind of increasing the chances of reproduction by seed. Orchids are found everywhere. Um, most people kind of associate orchids with steamy tropical dark jungles and this slide shows you that, a, you know, maybe 75 or more percent of the land mass occupied by this family of flowering plants is not steamy, hot, dark, tropical jungle. Uh, orchids have a reputation for being difficult to grow uh, because of this misperception. And when orchids were first brought into cultivation from all the different parts of the world, there was an assumption made that they needed to be put in the dark, in the heat, and in the steam. And that killed quite a lot of orchids that had been coming in to collection from around the world. And thus they had a reputation for being very difficult. So they grow both in tropical and temperate areas, but look what they're, where they're missing. We don't have any orchids in these high tundra and Arctic and subarctic regions, none in the, in the Antarctica at all. This should give you a hint, and here's where I need to mention that today, I hope you'll stick around, but we're not talking about how to grow orchids. We're talking about orchids as they exist in the wild here in Pinellas County. But generally speaking, orchids as a whole will leave Pinellas County and take a look at this huge family and where it exists around the world, nowhere near the Arctic region. So one little tip that I will give you today is that you should never put ice cubes on your orchids ever. I understand that out there, there's some sort of propaganda going on that the way to water orchids is with ice. Well, remember, here's where the orchids are distributed. Here's where the ice is distributed, please do not put ice cubes on your orchids, okay? So that's what makes an orchid and where they fit in into the scheme of things within all the other plants on earth. But how do they live? What, how do orchids actually go through their life cycles where they have different ways of living on earth? They can be epiphytic, which means they grow on other plants. They can be terrestrial, which means they grow out of the ground. We've already met an aquatic orchid, which means, of course, they live in the water. Lithophytic, do you know what that means? Do you know what litho, lithograph? Um, what, a, what other words have lith in it? Anyway, it means living on a stone or living on rocks. And mycoheterotrophic, that's the $20 word for the day. I'll give you a hint. Myco and mycology, some of y'all might know what mycology is. Mycology is the study of fungus. And we already heard that at certain points in a fungus life cycle, they are dependent on fungus. 
mycoheterotrophs are dependent their entire life cycle on fungus. Here's an example of an epiphytic orchid. Uh, the, the plant that it's growing on here would be uh, what looks like a bay tree with the bay leaves growing out of a side branch there. And the orchid is using its modified roots to hang on. The roots are covered in that velamen so they can absorb some of the rainfall as it, as it comes down, absorbing into the uh, plant parts. But this is a truly epiphytic plant growing on another plant. Here's a terrestrial, our habanaria, or one of the false rain orchids. Uh, this is after a burn in our flatwoods area. Uh, and this terrestrial orchid has come up out of the dry, sandy, acidic ground and is flowering just happily uh, out of the ground. Here's another photograph of that aquatic habanaria. It's actually in the same genus as, as this plant and they look very, very similar, uh, but their habitats are quite different. Uh, you might just picture in the background, the little spikes sticking up are the individual flowering stalks of this aquatic orchid. Here is a limestone cliff uh, in Georgia or Tennessee, I believe, and you can see plants clinging to the, uh, uh, to, the, to the rocks here. These are actually ferns, but mixed in within here are a couple of different species, many different uh, types of plants, both ferns, mosses, uh, and flowering plants all together, growing with their roots attached to rocks, making them technically lithophytic. And finally, mycoheterotrophic, the ones that are dependent on uh, a fungal relationship through their entire life cycle. So this is coral root, which is how that scientific name uh, translates. These uh, wild terrestrial orchids have been seen in Pinellas County. Uh, we've yet to spot them here on the preserve, although we're definitely keeping our eye open for that. Um, they do not have a lot of photosynthetic activity. They derive the majority of their nutrition, not from making it themselves through photosynthesis, but by associating themselves with a fungus. So most of us know orchids uh, from the ones in Publix. Uh, these have come down, or excuse me, any grocery store. We don't endorse any particular grocery store or box store or any other store where you might see something like this for sale. Um, how hard can it be? Let's just look, it says put some ice on it and we'll have these beautiful flowers forever and ever and ever. Well, like other flowering plants, orchids, of course, have a flowering season. And when they're done flowering, the flowers drop off and they wait until the next year. Uh, the good thing about orchids is their pollination syndrome uh, with their very specific pollination syndrome, individual flowers will last quite a long time, waiting and waiting and waiting to be pollinated by a member of their same species. So a flower can stay fresh as it waits for pollination and that makes them very long lasting, but not forever. Um, if you do choose to grow orchids, this of course is a a moth orchid, not one of our Pinellas native orchids. Obviously, they're mass produced on a huge scale. They're cloned so that every single plant comes out the same. But just remember, I can't stress enough, don't put ice cubes on your orchids ever. It's just not the right thing to do. If you have orchids growing indoors, you're gonna water one of them with room temperature water. Whatever water, whatever temperature the room is, the water should be. Also, if you're growing orchids outside, please don't spray them with ice water. Go ahead and water them with whatever the room temperature is outside at the time. Enough about that. Let's go through some of our wonderful Pinellas native orchid species that you can find when you visit our natural areas, not just Brooker Creek up here in Tarpon Springs, but all the parks that you can find in Pinellas County. Become an orchid hunter, but not an orchid thief. We'll start with the bearded grass pink. And this is the one that we had a look at earlier, whose flowers do not twist uh, during their development. They're not resupinate. So their lip is actually held up like a billboard. And it's bearded, the lip. There's the beard of the bearded grass pink. 
Uh, they live in wet meadows. Um, they're often associated with carnivorous plants, the wet meadows that burn uh, during the autumn and winter. Uh, when the new growth comes up, there's no competition. The soil is nice and acidic, and these grass pink orchids come up in huge numbers. We have a couple of different species. There's three. We've actually spotted two different species of calipogon. Uh, one that holds its arms up over its head and the other that holds its arms out to the side. So that's calipogon pallidus, which means that it's pale, and calipo calipogon barbatus, which means it has this beard. Now we happened to notice a calipogon barbatus species, a bearded grass pink species this spring uh, that was pure white. And it's not unusual for plants that are normally pink or purple to occasionally have uh, a white form. Uh, so we took a bunch of pictures of this one. We thought it was you know, quite beautiful. We hadn't seen many, uh, many calipogons here at Brooker Creek. So we you know, photographed all we could and we put it up on um, iNaturalist, which is um, a kind of a plant identification and recording. Uh, it's citizen science. It's a huge database. database. Um, it's a very good tool to use as an amateur naturalist. It's iNaturalist. Anyway, we put the pictures of the white calipogon up and it blew up. Apparently, this is a botanical unicorn and only a handful of people have ever seen white Calipogon barbatus. So little did we know, we were just taking pictures of a pretty picture, but we had come across something very, very special. And so that's one of the reasons that we have areas like Brooker Creek Preserve to keep these things in preservation in perpetuity. Let me tell you the trick of calipogon. And this is, this is trickery. This is botanical trickery. And why the bearded grass pink has this beard. Uh, you'll remember in other orchid species, the lip is modified into a landing pad where the insect would land and walk towards the nectar reward and be dusted with or be delivered the pollinia, the package of pollen that it will then take to another flower. The calipogon uses trickery. So it has not flipped its flower over. The lip is sticking up in the air and it's covered in these little hairs. Now these hairs resemble the anthers of perhaps a different species of, or no, uh, a, a different kind of plant where anthers um, advertise the center of the flower. And if you crawl through the ant anthers, you will find your nectar reward. Well, that's not happening with this orchid. They've made these fake anthers and the bee lands on the fake anthers, expecting to dig down a little bit and find nectar. Well, there's none. The nectar's not produced on the lip. What happens is this petal is hinged. And when the weight of the bee lands upon these fake anthers, that hinge pulls the bee and the petal all the way down and smacks the bee onto this little surface here. And this surface is where the basket of pollen is located. So the plant physically slams the bee into its pollen basket. The bee doesn't know what just happened. It didn't get any nectar reward. These aren't real anthers as it turns out. And the bee flies away with pollen stuck to it. Silly bee tries it again, lands on the beard of a nearby plant and gets slammed on again and transfers that pollen to another flower. Pollination syndrome, very tricky. Um, no bees are harmed in the execution of this pollination syndrome. Next up, we'll look at our Pinellas County ghost orchid. You might have heard of the famous Everglades ghost orchid, uh, famous and infamous at the same time. Uh, we have a member of the same genus uh, right here in Pinellas County, this is the needle root air plant orchid. Right here in, in Brooker, we refer to these as just our ghost orchid. Not anywhere near as showy as the Everglades species, uh, but nonetheless, uh, no less special. It's threatened, like most orchids, from development and uh, 
land development and from collection by uh, hobbyists, uh, often found, according to the literature, in old citrus trees. Uh, the more that we explore uh, the preserve out here at Brooker, the more we go uh, into areas of smooth barked trees, like um, areas where holly is the dominant tree species, areas where maple, also a, a tree with smooth bark, uh, we often find these plants. And so they're locally quite abundant. Um, they're very, very easy to miss because they have no leaves. Here we have a close-up of the ghost orchid. It's nothing but roots. And here we have the flowers and the fruits, the seed pods from the previous year. No leaves. All the photosynthesis is taking place within these roots that are also covered in that special uh, mater material, special substance called velamin that is absorbent. But inside the roots is the chlorophyll that produces the sugars to drive this plant through its life cycle. The flowers are vanishingly small. These plants are probably mosqui uh, mosquito pollinated. Yes, mosquitoes do have an educational role, education, um, ecological role. They fill an ecological niche. Uh, male mosquitoes are in fact insectivorous as are female mosquitoes. Unfortunately, the females need blood to lay their eggs. Moving on, this is not about mosquitoes. Here we have some other photographs of the, this ghost orchid. You'll see no leaves, no leaves. Um, this is your presenter kind of in the middle here uh, for scale and, and for a little bit of a creepy factor. Uh, this is the first ghost orchid that I ever saw and I was quite, quite excited to see it. And now we kind of see them all the time. Now that we know what we're looking for, we kind of see them all the time. So. Moving on to our next species, probably our most famous, uh, the Florida butterfly orchid. Uh, this one flowers um, faithfully every June in our swamp areas. Uh, this is, an, as we met before, this is one of our epiphytic orchids. Uh, from about Tampa southward, it's very, very, very widespread. Um, and in swamps, it can be very, very numerous. If you ever go to Mayaka in June, you will find the trees absolutely dripping in the butterfly orchid flowers. It's named Encyclia tampensis. Encyclia because the petals form a little circle around that pollen structure uh, and tampensis after our very own Tampa. This is a typical orchid with the resupinate or the twisted flowers where the lip is down below uh, with markings that will guide the insect into this tunnel where the pollinia or the sac of pollen is distributed on its back. There's a lot of variation in color in the Encyclia tampensis in the Tampa butterfly orchid. Um, this plant is actually cultivated uh, it's very hard, if not impossible, to grow orchids from seed, uh, but they respond well to tissue culture. So some plants have been collected in the past out of the wild uh, illegally, uh, but once they're in cultivation, a much easier way to reproduce those plants is through cloning, through cell uh, tissue culture, and there are a lot of cultivars of the Tampa butterfly orchid with varying degrees of pink on the lip, varying degrees of brown to orange in the petals. You can see uh, the bit of orange in the petals here. And some can be quite fragrant as well. So these plants are in cultivation. There's absolutely no need uh, to take any plants out of the wild, much less any of our native orchids, which I think they're all considered, all of our native orchids might be considered at least threatened, if not endangered. Here's the Tampa butterfly orchid going into fruit. So where you see each one of these, there was a single flower upon pollination. Uh, the eggs were fertilized, and now those eggs are developing into those dust-like seeds within this fruit, within these seed pods, which you'll recall upon ripening, are going to split along six lines and release those dust-like seeds. 
The leaves are evergreen. The plants are perennial. They have these swollen leaf bases called pseudobulbs. Uh, and this one plant will continue to produce pseudobulbs and uh, will form quite a large colony as long as it's undisturbed on the bark where it's growing. The Chinese crown orchid um, has established itself in Pinellas County. It is not a native orchid. Um, it's rather new on the scene. It tends to come up out of nowhere and it's a very showy, very tall, very spindly orchid. Um, graminia, it's, made, it's uh, Eulothia graminia. Graminia means it's like grass. So you can see these tall, spindly flower spikes, um, very, very grass-like. What's unique about this terrestrial orchid are these huge pseudobulbs. I have seen crown orchid pseudobulbs as big as my fist. So this allows it to be, of course, very drought tolerant. This swollen leaf base, this pseudobulb is gonna uh, hold a lot of moisture. You can see that it's green, so it can photosynthesize when the plant is not in leaf or flower. And you can see the flowering stalks emerging up out of the base here. Um, not particular as to where it grows, not particular to any rare type of fungus to get this plant started. Uh, this is an import. This is, of course, an Asian species. Uh, this has been moved around in mulch. Um, I found these plants growing quite happily in some red painted mulch in a Publix parking lot in an island. So a tough thing. Um, these have actually been added to the invasive species list. So imagine that, an invasive orchid. Um, here you can see a patch where the individual pseudobulbs, those big swellings, have divided many, many times, each one producing several flower spikes. If you see a terrestrial orchid flowering in this kind of abundance at this height uh, with a pink lip, you are probably looking at Eulothia graminia. You're probably looking at the Chinese uh, helmet orchid. Uh, it is an invasive plant. If you have it on your property, you might want to get a second opinion, send a photograph uh, to your extension services for proper identification. But if you see that large pseudobulb, you'll probably be sure what you're looking at. Here it is adapted to growing in the really harshest of conditions. Again, uh, the seeds of this individual plant may have come in on mulch. That's where we think it entered into the country. Back to some of our natives and in alphabetical order, we will meet the habanarias. Uh, Habina, H-A-B-E-N-A, -E let me highlight H-A-B-E-N-A, -E uh, that's a Greek or Roman, I can't remember, Greek or Latin word for reins, R-E-I-N, the reins that you pull uh, to control or at least try to control a horse. Uh, because of the, the petals uh, that stick out to the side of the individual flowers of the Habanaria orchids reminded someone of the reins that you pull to try and control a horse. This particular species is Floribunda, which means it produces lots and lots of flowers. The individual flowers you can see are green. Uh, they're not particularly large. And they have quite a sweet fragrance. So these are another orchid that might be pollinated by flies, uh, attracting as many flies are uh, to odors, some foul, some sweet, uh, but these tiny little green orchid flowers might be pollinated by something as humble as a fly. Here's a couple of, here's that, uh, again, this is a terrestrial. Here's the one growing up after a fire. Uh, so no shrinking violet, this one. Very, very tough, growing in an upland sandy soil, doing just fine and producing sprays of these little fragrant um, green flowers. And here you can see the lip has um, kind of dripped down. It's not really acting as a landing pad anymore. Whatever pollinates this can probably fly right in or perhaps even hover in front of the flower without actually having to land on the petal and walk in. Another species of the habanaria is that aquatic that we looked at before, the water spider. And here you can see in close up uh, those spindly little thin 
petals. Uh, those are those thin lateral petals that reminded someone of the reins that you would pull on. Um, R-E-I-N, um, giving the habanaria its genus name. These are truly aquatic. They're floating, they produce rafts. Uh, those rafts that these um, orchids produce uh, can actually get some hitchhikers along. So we have not just the orchids growing in this raft, but some other semi-aquatic and aquatic plants have uh, kind of latched onto their raft and they're just floating about this lake about two miles east of us down Keystone Road. Uh, this is one of the uh, Lake Dan complex of lakes. And that's my finger obscuring. I mean, even with our fancy cell phones, some of us still can't take very good pictures. Anyway, a little bit more of a close up. You can see the individual flower stalks on this floating raft of the water spider orchid. Apinaria repens. The giant orchid, another terrestrial. So the majority of our, you'll, you'll note that the majority of our uh, Pinellas orchids are terrestrial. There's only a couple so far of the epiphytic orchids, but the giant orchid uh, lives in grasslands and its leaves are very, very tall and narrow and they're very grass-like. And they are also very fire tolerant and adapted as grasses are. Uh, used to find this one everywhere, but now because of habitat destruction, it's kind of hard to find. If you look closely at this spike, um, you can see what I'm encircling here is a little patch of purple at the base of these petals. You can kind of see it throughout this inflorescence. Um, it has these side petals that kind of stick up like toothpicks, but you can see a little bit of purple down in the flower that kind of acts as a beacon uh, for the pollinator. Now I call this a giant orchid and that is, I suppose, kind of arguable because this is my, this is my boss and she's normal sized and this is her taking a picture of one of these giant orchids. This particular individual, you can just see, uh, the, and she's close to it, um, and you can see the little bit of purple in there. Uh, this happens to be a very small population. We did later find uh, some giant orchids that more or less lived up to their name. And here we have the giant orchid being almost as tall as your presenter. Uh, this is plants that we missed flowering, but here it is in fruit. So you can see these can be uh, a meter and a half tall. These are the plants that we have here on the preserve. These are a form that is lacking that purple spot. They're all yellow. So it's the yellow form of the giant orchid. And you can see in this picture where it's growing in this kind of grassy area along with other upland plants like the, like the various pine trees. Our next letter in the alphabet is P for Pagonia. And this is the snake mouth orchid, another terrestrial. Uh, this one is like and often grows with the bearded grass pink. So you often see these growing together. They like the same conditions. They like a wet meadow, a seasonally flooded, acidic wet meadow. Uh, they like regular fires to come through and clear off last year's uh, stems, last year's grass leaves, uh, just burn everything down. Um, and then these plants can germinate, or actually they're perennial, they grow from year to year, so they can um, begin to grow and they flower around April. So we look for um, the bearded grass pinks, the calipogons, and we look for the snake mouth orchids, the pagonias, around April time, mid-April time. Uh, in these wet meadows, often associated with carnivorous plants like the sundews um, and the butterworts and those kinds of things that also live in very acidic soils. You can see the landing pad here is quite uh, the lip, the labellum, is actually quite ornate. Uh, this is another variable orchid. You can see uh, this one with the bright yellow in the center. Here's one that's green in the center uh, with that kind of serrated or jagged landing pad or lip. Here's a very pale um, member of the very same species. You can see a kind of common characteristic, or at least in this population, uh, these two petals kind of overlap each other um, and the two side petals out to the side. 
So again, that is our snake mouth orchid, another terrestrial, uh, seasonal, once fruited, you won't notice this orchid out in the wild. Its leaves are grassy as it lives with its grass neighbors. Very, very easy to overlook. Here's a very large terrestrial orchid, uh, arguably. Uh, the individual flowers, very, very succulent, fleshy petals, uh, very well suited for maybe a brutish, brutish uh, pollinator. Uh, like a larger bee or a beetle or something that might get in here and damage very delicate petals. Uh, this one's built to withstand that. Uh, we've got the landing pad. We have a nice robust uh, tubular uh, entryway uh, where that pollinia, that, that bag of pollen can be deposited on whatever pollinator. Um, these are quite often found south of here as you go south on the interstate along roadsides that aren't too often mown. They like to live within the grasses like some of the others that we met. Uh, they like the low-lying areas, so they like the ditches. So you can find these bright orange orchids on you know half a meter, meter and a half tall, anywhere within that kind of range. Uh, spikes again, uh, right around the end of spring and beginning of summer. So June-ish, May and June-ish would be when you could start looking for the leafless beaked ladies' tresses or Sacoila. There's not really a good way around the name of this orchid. Um, you're probably just as well to make up your own. I don't care for leafless beaked ladies' tresses and I don't care for the scientific name Sacoila either. But here we have it. It exists nonetheless. It's a lovely thing. Again, a couple of different shots. You can see the, the little hairs that are apparent on the individual petals. And this is a great shot of that, um, the prize found in the back of this flower, the nectary, uh, which is going to reward whatever dares crawl down into this tube uh, to receive the nectar reward and in so doing receive the pollen that will be transferred to another plant. Another shot, unfortunately, you can see what this plant is growing with here at Brooker. If you're familiar with your invasive plants, this of course is Caesar weed. Uh, so we did our best to rescue these plants from uh, the Caesar weed, which had established itself and was trying to, wasn't trying to, but was effectively shading these plants out. So we tried to do our own little plant rescue, but digging this plant up and moving it would probably doom it. Orchids do not like to be moved. Terrestrial orchids have established themselves with the fungus that they may or may not depend on throughout their entire lives. They certainly did germinate in that spot with the fungus that they at least needed to germinate. Uh, digging this plant up and moving it, you might damage the roots for one, B, you might then place it into an area that is detrimental to the health of its associated fungus, thus killing both the fungus and the orchid at the same time. Removing epiphytic orchids from the trunks of trees, the same things can happen. Damage the roots, which then cannot provide uh, for the entire plant, uh, and diminish the health or eliminate the, the fungus altogether. Um, so moving orchids around is certainly never advocated. The real ladies' tresses belong to a group, a genus called spiranthes. And can you guess why they're called spiranthes? Do you know, what's, you know what spiral means? Do you see a spiral in this picture? How about this one? Yes. One of the characteristics of this genus is that the flowers are produced in these kind of comedy spirals, spiral staircase around very thin uh, stalks. Another terrestrial. We have about five different species, but they really do look more alike than different. The difference is you have to be down on your knees with a hand lens, which of course we've done. Um, but most people, it's not really necessary. If you can say, hey, there's a lady's tresses, there's a spiranthes even better. Um, you'll see these plants early in the spring, again around April time, uh, around, uh, we usually see some really, really tall ones every Easter, interestingly, 
These are another uh, plant that's been adapted to live in fire dependent and fire adapted communities among grasses. Um, we have two or three that uh, flower early in the spring. So the ladies tresses, very delicate, bright white, um, very, very uh, showy despite their diminutive size. Here's a weird one that might not even look anything like an orchid. Um, this one is another of the ones that travel in mulch. And it's thought that perhaps uh, the gentian nodding caps is another orchid that was imported uh, into Florida um, agriculturally or horticulturally, either through the import of an agricultural product perhaps grass seed uh, that was sown that had some of the orchid seeds with it. And once that seed was sown in the pasture, it found the right kind of fungus it needed to um, germinate and grow and is now established. It could have always been here. We're just not quite sure. But what we can say is uh, those people who spend an awful lot of their time in the wilds looking for various plants, the field botanists, um, they report that they see many more, fewer of these plants out in the field than they do around developed areas. So either this plant is expert at adapting to human conditions and they simply do better in developed areas, or this is a plant that was imported and has only just kind of dipped its toe into exploring or doesn't do quite as well into truly natural areas. On close up, you can just maybe make out how this plant has a typical orchid flower. Again, resupinate, we have this lip, but these plants, they don't really care about their flowers. These plants, self-pollinate. So they kind of forego the whole trouble of making nectar and showy flowers and landing pads and pollen sacs. I mean, they will, and perhaps every once in a million uh, cross-pollination will take place. But generally speaking, this plant reproduces uh, by dividing itself, uh, by forming larger and larger little individual colonies just by offsets, uh, and by making its own seed through self-pollination and self-fertilization. So that's the Triphora, uh, the gentian nodding caps. And we'll finish up with the letter Z. So we went from, I think, C to Z. Did we start with Calipogon? Anyway, almost A to Z, but we have a Z orchid. It's another non-native, but it's established. It's not invasive. Uh, it's not considered invasive like the Chinese crown orchid. And if, let me just mention that if our gentian nodding caps is not native, it is also not considered an invasive. So it's not displacing any of our native species. Uh, the lawn orchid, you can guess from the common name where this one's likely to be found. Yes, it comes up in lawns. It, it has adapted to the lawnmower. This is a short little orchid. Um, Zuxine is its uh, genus name. Um, whatever this says, um, stratomachia or whatever, that means helmet. And you can see that uh, someone imagined that these itty bitty little flowers reminded them of a helmet. So this is a tiny little spike, probably only two or three inches tall. These appear in lawns around February, March, and April. Uh, they do have a nice showy yellow lower lip. Um, not a problem in lawns. They just happen to like living in, in cultivated grassy areas. So you'll find this one in flower beds and in lawns, uh, does no trouble. Easily overlooked. Um, if you have ever seen white clover in a lawn, you could mistake this for white clover because the flowering heads are slightly globular like white clover heads, but it's actually a little tiny imported lawn orchid, zuxine. So if you have orchid questions, um, I'll definitely put my email address up. Um, there's one right here under my face, my UF address. Uh, if you would like to ask me anything but orchid cultivation, I would be more than happy if I don't know uh, to find you that answer. 
Um, most of the information that I've gathered has been from uh, hanging out with orchid specialists, especially wild orchid specialists, asking my own questions, working in the field, making observations. Um, and we also have access uh, to the wild orchids of Florida, um, which ironically is called updated and expanded. But since the publishing of this book, uh, we have uh, some new orchids that have been discovered, some orchids that we have sadly lost. And there has been, of course, because it's botany, quite a lot of name changes. But it's still a, a more or less complete reference to the wild and established orchids right here in Florida. So thanks for joining us today. I really hope you enjoyed Pinellas County Native Orchids, and I hope that it inspires you to go out and, and look for some of these and appreciate them, all orchids, great and small. Um, if you do have any further questions, comments, complaints, you can send them to my Pinellas County address, which I'll leave here. Uh, we have two more Florida Supernature um, webinar presentations uh, to round out the month. We'll be doing epiphytes next Wednesday and finishing up with ferns on July 29. After that, we'll be moving outside and we'll be bringing you, foolishly, we'll be moving outside because it's August. And we'll be bringing you some notes from the field and we'll see what we can find going on in our upland, wetland, and everything in between habitats right here at Brooker Creek Preserve. To sign up for the following uh, webinars, here's the address. It's uh, bit.ly, Florida Supernature, and we will uh, also be advertising on our Facebook page. If you're not already a fan of the Brooker Creek Environmental Education Center, please give us a thumbs up, join us, follow us. That's where you're going to find out about all of our new and exciting programming that's coming up. So for today, thank you very much for joining us, and we hope to see you next week. Thank you.